Welcome to the first episode of Elasmocast, where we talk about everything sharks and the relatives. I'm Ben. And I'm Chase. And today we'll be talking about the top 10 macro predatory sharks. Now, Chase, what is a macro predator? A macro predator is essentially a very decent sized predator compared to the naked eye. And in particular, we're going to be talking about middle to large size range sharks that essentially are the apex predators in their ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And for this list, we're just going to be talking about salations, which are the true sharks, if you will. Maybe in another video, we'll talk about other chondrichthines, but for now, we're just sticking with those. And essentially, you've compiled a list of 10, I've compiled a list of 10, and we're going to see whose list most represents the top macro predators. It's a shame we can't put in monster ratfish from the Paleozoic, but that's okay. We'll that's save right. that for another discussion. I suppose. I suppose. So without so. further ado, what is your number 10 on this list? Oh, My number 10 is Credalomna bryanti, which is a very respectably sized Credalomna as some of the paratypes for the specimen paratype being the teeth that are used to describe the organism, but not the hollow types. Um, they get over an inch long. And so that's that's pretty big for a Credalamna in the Cretaceous. And they're kind of existing in that point of time where Cretoxyrhina, which we'll mention later, is more or less getting phased out. It's going extinct. And so this animal, truly is the typical apex shark of its time, besides the very occasional Cretoxyrhina. So I guess there's a little bit of caveat, and that's why it's at 10, because uh, it doesn't get too gigantic. But that's that's my choice at 10. I think it's good, named after the good old Alabama coach Bear Bryant. <laughs> Had and to make the list. How big do their, their teeth usually get? Uh, I've seen them, it, I mean, depending on position, a good anterior, probably about three quarters of an inch to an inch, maybe even an inch and a quarter, uh, which is, it's a respectably sized shark, especially compared to other sharks in the lower campanian of Alabama and of the Mississippi embayment proper, mm -hmm. which I'm sure we'll have a picture of the Mississippi embayment in all its glory, but yeah. Uh, Interesting. Now we have to know what your number 10 is. My number 10 is Spinotus longidens. So this is a Jurassic shark. If you don't know in the Jurassic, that's really when we start seeing like the rise of the true modern sharks and rays, like ones that we had more so recognize today. A lot of the extant orders come about during this time. So, but at this time, most sharks were pretty small they weren't necessarily the dominant animals in their ecosystems but Spinotus longidens had these really long thing like teeth that were that could exceed an inch and a half in length which is monstrous mm. for a shark at this time and just for the age alone this was one of the first true macro predatory sharks in my opinion and I think it definitely deserves a place on this list it's respectable. What do you think something like that would have eaten? Oh boy. It has grasping teeth, so probably it was clutching onto things that were slippery. So I would imagine it would have been a fish eater. Primarily. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's What's your probably number nine. Probably a few balemnites too, you know. Oh yeah. A few squid Did that got nibbled slippery, on. Those, yeah. Yeah, those interlocking. <laughs> Does the job, but you know, there are enough bolemnites out there. I'm a big shark. Uh, my number nine is Ceratolamna maracana. Uh, and typically, this shark goes by the name Credalamna maracana, but a few uh, of the more recent publications on the taxon have put it in Ceratolamna. And I have to agree, just based on the very, very notable lack of lingual protuberance, which we'll show a picture of. Um, and they got pretty hefty. They especially 
they maintain their size pretty well. I've seen some about at the inch and a quarter mark. And that's pretty, that's pretty big for a very, very late Cretaceous shark. Um, especially when considering you have a lot of the very large sharks like Cretaxirina out of the picture at that point. Um, an inch and a quarter is respectable for a Ceratolamna maracana. And they're really cool with those amazing broad crown and the essentially cusps that kind of offset in each way from the main crown. Mm -hmm. That's cool. an interesting choice. I personally <laughs> wouldn't have seen that on this list, but I I will say some of the there's something different going on in the waters of Morocco back then because some of those got big, just a bunch of different species. But in particular, Stratolamna maracana, you can get some hefty teeth from that species over there in mm -hmm. Morocco. Yeah, I don't know. There must have been something in the water. I mean. It's probably where the world's first steroids were invented. We'll go with that because <laughs> they were just built different over there. I've never, I, I mean, I've only seen one or two Ceratolamna maracana from Alabama and Mississippi that even compares to the size, let alone the crown width of the monsters from Morocco. But, of just like what's average there. Yeah, I know. It's just not fair. I mean, something happened lord knows what but see what your number nine is now so on the opposite end of rarity i would go with dikia scarathy which was essentially a clinid or salacious or a frill shark on steroids this was these were found in the late cretaceous the late campanian of hornby island canada and these were essentially frill sharks that would reach at least seven meters in size. So these were like great white, massive, great white size frill sharks that inhabited the deep seas of North America, which is really, really cool because they have those almost clouded on, but it's completely convergent. They have three principal cut or they have a principal cusp and two really long um, lateral cusp splits as well that are quite similar in size which is a really unique characteristic amongst the frill sharks within the salations and yeah this thing was a monster and I can't imagine anything else really hunting down a great white sized frill shark <laughs> and do you think that this taxon was just sister or closely related to our modern day frill sharks or do you think that they evolved into it what are your thoughts so i don't think that they are sister they are they are closely related they're within the same family as the frill sharks clemid or salachidae but i wouldn't go so far as to say that they were sister from each other there is another group uh, or another genus that also existed within this locality, Ralphodon, which is another Clemeter salicid. So there is Clemeter salicids by the late Cretaceous have already diverged and split off into different sects. But the only one that we still see today is the genus Clemeter salicis. Interesting. I had to Google that one. I had to Google <laughs> your, your number nine. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a newly described tax. It was what, 2019 that was described? I think so, after looking yeah. it up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I believe. Don't quote me on that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Shall so we move, move on? on? Yeah. Let's go to number eight. All right. So my number eight, I put uh, Cardabiodon venator. Okay, and okay yeah we're getting into the elaborate sharks uh, yeah i know um these sharks are really interesting especially because cardabiodon is known as a small tooth genus um and to be fair like tooth to body size in some of these lamniforms do kind of trend bigger teeth smaller body you know what I mean? Like small teeth, yeah. big body. Their, their teeth kind of equal out as you go through the Cretaceous end of the Cenozoic. But um, taking that into consideration, we get near 
uh, you know, unofficial reports of near two inch cardiobiodon venator. And considering the fact that that's a small, small tooth genus, I mean, you had to think that was just one of the largest sharks known. I mean, I think estimates put a typical cardiobiodon venator at about 16 feet um, based on the kind of like tooth to vertebrae size. Mm -hmm. um, and just considering that some of the bigger teeth are sitting in private collections and haven't been researched. I can't imagine how much more that average would grow when we start finding some more. And they had a very, very interesting, robust dentition. That's just really cool to look at. And they're hard yeah. to find. And they're just overall a really, really unique shark, especially for the early late Cretaceous. Yeah. And anyone that knows me knows that Cardiobiodon Venator is one of my all-time favorites. So that's definitely a solid, solid pick. And it's it's important to note, too, that a lot of these Cretaceous Lomniforms, they were small tooth, which means that for a tooth of a comparable size to a modern tooth, so if you had an inch-long, say, Great White versus an inch-long Cretaxirhina, the inch-long Cretaxirhina would come along with a much larger vertebrate meaning that that is a larger fish. So a lot of these Cretaceous sharks, when you look at these teeth and you say, oh, that's not that big, that came from a big shark for a lot of them. And that, that's a trend that we see again, like a lot of the more recent lomniforms, their tooth sizes increase, but their vertebrae decreases. So they're, they aren't as big relatively to these Cretaceous sharks, but... I don't know. It's an interesting trend. For my yes. number eight, I went again down the more deep water route, but I actually put an extant shark here. So this shark is still alive uh -oh. today. I have Somniosis microcephalus, which the common name is the Greenland shark, because those are some hefty boys. Those are really big. They're one of the largest sharks that are alive today, one of the largest macropredatory ones, at least with reports of individuals reaching 7.3 meters in length. And oh. these are dense sharks too. Their, <laughs> their bodies literally look like freaking tubes. Big. <laughs> <laughs> A thin cylinder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wouldn't even say thin for some of them. But these, no. were, these are some monstrous sharks. And they also have the largest... I believe the longest lifespan of any known living vertebrate too, which is really cool. So these sharks reach maturity at very late stages in their lives. And it's crazy because their metabolism is oh so very low that they can only have, they only need to sustain themselves despite the fact that they're like 20 feet plus mm -hmm. in length only need like three or four decent meals a year and they can just kind of sit down there in the deep arctic kind of like the colossal squid of the antarctic yeah. as well and though though we have to say i mean there's the trade-off don't have to eat very much have parasites almost exclusively making you blind oh so. yeah they're they're apex predators and a lot of them are completely blind because parasites attach to their eyes just what crazy. a way to live yeah. what a way to live hey you know at least they'll be okay. Global warming, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Deep water shark, you know. Well, really, hey, it's really good to have weird. some modern representation on this list. Absolutely. Because there's still some cool sharks out there today. There are. We're at, what, number seven now? Yeah, we are. So what do you got for seven? I've got the good old Cretaceous goblin, Scapanorhynchus texanus. It's okay. just, it can't be a list of these macro predatory sharks without Scapanorhynchus texanus because these sharks got massive. And mm -hmm. just considering the fact that we know from some of these Cinemanian smaller Scapanorhynchus that the, the snout, the giant sensory snout on them is a basal trait, horrifies me when you think we have <laughs> like two and a half max inch Scapanorhynchus texanus floating around, especially in the Americas. I mean, I just, yeah. that is just something when you picture it, I don't like mm -hmm. that. That's a very angry dentition. I do always wonder, um, I've always wondered why people don't take a really close look and maybe they have, I've just missed it on if 
these fossils had the specific muscles so where they would like their teeth protrude would, out protrude out and catch prey yeah. that'd be the coolest but also really horrifying but yeah they're really really interesting sharks um and they dominate especially in the santonian and a little bit in the campanian they kind of fade in the mississippi embayment but continue how big, elsewhere how big do you think a scapanorhynchus with these teeth exceeding two inches would be on um, like how large of an individual do you think that would man be? that's a difficult that's a difficult question i mean Typically, I would expect if it was a normal shark, uh, I think the general consensus, and this is fairly inaccurate, that's been proven, about, you know, 10 feet, an inch of tooth. So that's mm -hmm. a respectable 20 plus foot shark. Though also, you got to wonder how big the snout was. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, if they had, if there are more shallow water animal, Scapanorhynchus texanus. So I wonder if perhaps that snout shrank I'm not sure. I don't think we've seen soft tissue preservation scapanorhynchus. I might be wrong with that. Uh, but it'd be really nice to figure out how big the snouts were on those things because that 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 can make or break a 22, 23 foot shark to a 28, 29, 30 foot shark is just the snout on that thing. <laughs> so another thing too is do we know if it's a small tooth or a large tooth genus? Because, because it is a very basal shark, so it it's is. possible we'd have to look at some articulated skeletons. Because mm -hmm. I don't know off the top of my head, but nevertheless, it must have been a massive, massive goblin shark. Absolutely, and you think I would think we could possibly with some of these full skeletons of earlier Scapanorhynchus, maybe get an idea when we compare them to another shark in their family, the modern goblin shark, Mitsukurina, maybe we can get a decent idea on tooth to body size ratio through mm -hmm. that. But regardless, uh, two and a quarter inch Scapanorhynchus is gonna be a monster no matter how you split it. Yeah. And another thing too is it's not, it's not terribly uncommon to find over two inch scapanorhynchus teeth like it's it's not like this really like hard threshold to find like that's your once in lifetime find like you can probably in alabama or mississippi pull through one of those fairly easily yeah i think the most two plus inch scapanorhynchus i found in one trip albeit it was a like a very condensed lag layer in alabama i pulled three two inch Scapanorhynchus out of there mm -hmm. so they're not just freaks of nature they are actually somewhat common yeah so it's crazy but enough of our little snooty boys <laughs> what is your number seven my number seven is Alopius platysi which is the last of the giant thresher lineage this is when the giant thresher developed serrations in the Miocene because you can find, while, you know, they're not common teeth, you can find them at exceeding two inches, which is, for a thresher, can you imagine a thresher with two-inch teeth? The tail. <laughs> yeah. So we don't know. We don't know if they had the long tail that um, the modern threshers have. It probably wouldn't have been so practical to have that. And especially with the teeth becoming convergently similar to like, say, a great white or I'd say, yeah, probably close to like a great white or megalodon with the serration. So it probably wound up filling a similar niche to those, albeit, I mean, it was a lot smaller than megalodon, but still, it probably would have had a similar niche to those in juvenile megalodons. Um, but yeah, again, we don't have any articulated skeletons of this or specimens so we can't know for sure if it had all that tail but it still must have been a massive massive shark absolutely you would think maybe just despite the fact that almost assuredly this like teeth becoming serrated means that more or less the long tail would have come became somewhat vestigial unless they were mm -hmm. whipping <laughs> 
turtles are hard bodied, really hard bodied organisms and yeah. using their serrations. I mean, that's, that's, that doesn't seem plausible to me, but yeah. I would assume that their tail body size would shrink, but it'd still be just a hoss of a shark and <laughs> just exceedingly rare too. So I'm sure they had to have probably been a pelagic shark. Yeah, I'd imagine so. Mm-hmm. And keep in mind too, modern threshers, their teeth are tiny. They, they really mm-hmm. don't have very large teeth or very stout teeth. They are. So, that is very true. The Miocene was an interesting time. Absolutely. You get <laughs> giant sharks no matter where you turn in the Miocene. <laughs> it's lovely. Yeah. We love the Miocene. So Miocene's Anu number one. six. Oh, what do you got? All right. I pulled I pulled Crotodus uh, Crisidens in at six, mm-hmm. mainly just because some of their teeth got over three inches in size, <laughs> which is a monstrosity of a shark. Uh, what's interesting is we have teeth that are kind of that Crassidens morphotype in Alabama, mm-hmm. much younger than when is when it was expected to have went extinct. Ours are perhaps middle to late Santonian in age, which is very, very far from when we expected them to go extinct, which is quite odd. Perhaps mm-hmm. the Mississippi embayment was a holdout for them, maybe like a little holdout population. But we mm-hmm. have this one <laughs> lateral crotodus that is easily over two inches in mm-hmm. um, length on the the mesial uh, cutting edge. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these sharks had to have gotten massive, um, but all the, all the cool ones are in Texas. We just, (laughs) I mean, it'd make my career to find a Crotodus in Alabama. Yeah. And those are very basal too. That's true. Yeah. Oh Lord. I can't imagine a small tooth genus Crotodus with 30 inch (laughs) teeth. That's going to be a hoss. Yeah, a true monster. And my, but. and my number six, I got another Cretaceous one too. So Cretaceous seems to be a very, um, very cruel world when it comes to the marine territories. You had a lot and on of, land. A lot of, oh yeah, you had a lot of apex <laughs> predators both in the water and on land. It was, and in the sky. It was, would not want to live in the Cretaceous. No. But my number six, I got um, Crotoxyrhina mantelli, which is the Ginsu shark. You find that you find them in Alabama and Mississippi. You can find them in Kansas, Texas. Can find them pretty much in many different Cretaceous sites throughout the world. It was a very, it was a cosmopolitan shark, so it had very large distribution, and. Their teeth can often, I mean, not often, but, you know, you can find over two inch Cretaxyrhina. I've seen one over three inches, which must have come from massive, (sighs) massive shark. It was from Kansas. And yeah, this was a no joke shark. They've what found, um, they found Moses or bones with their, with the um, Cretaxyrhina teeth marks on them and stuff. So this shark was eating everything and it was a small tooth genus as well. So for, for those teeth, you had a much larger shark in proportion than in, um, in the more recent world with lamniforms. So it was, it was a no joke shark, especially considering a small tooth genus with over three, with that three and a quarter inch tooth that I saw. Oh boy. And the fact oh, wow. we've got we've got some of those Cretaxyrhina teeth lodged in pterosaur neck vertebrae. I mean, they didn't play at all. Yeah. Anything was game. And that's yeah. just, I mean, that's impressive. I mean, I'm sure the pterosaur was probably in the water, but mm-hmm. if it wasn't, that's just mm, a beautiful picture to place in all of our heads. I'm sure there's somebody who's done paleo art of it. If so, we'll put it. Yeah, I'll put it here. Um, and this was also they also lasted a long time geologically, like as a species did. compared to a lot of others. 
So they were highly successful. That's true. And it's interesting. They, you know, they gave up cusps. I thought that was kind of interesting that we still find them in laterals. And sometimes yeah. we even find them in interior laterals in Alabama. Mm-hmm. You can find Very them odd. in posteriors too. I would expect them more in posteriors just because I've always thought that posteriors typically evolve later than interiors just because of their lack of use. But it's weird going into a creek in Alabama and finding a, a cusped interior lateral late Santonian, maybe even early Campanian, depending on where in the Tombigbee sand you are. That's mm -hmm. it's just strange. Some strange dichotomy with the cusps going on. But where are we now? We're at five? We're into the top five now. What do you got for number five? Number five, I've got the good old bull shark. Bro, uh, the Carcarinus bull shark? Lucas. The bull shark went above mm -hmm. Crotonus Crassidens. It did, yeah. Because <laughs> you know what? Crotonus is a little sissy that can't go into fresh water. Don't quote me, we don't know that. But we know that bull sharks can live, straight up live in fresh water. They can reproduce. Interesting they fact, can by the way. Oh, go ahead, yeah. So you can actually find, albeit very rarely, a crotodus tooth in the chem, chem beds of Morocco, which I believe, if I remember correctly, that was brackish, right? Or I would think have been, so. Yeah, either brackish or it probably would have had some sort of like estuaries there. But mm -hmm. yeah, that, so you that can actually, oh, I found ahead, it interesting that you could find that they found crotodus totus there and left styrax and a couple others mm -hmm. it doesn't really shock me that you could find them and uh i i mean i don't know what the kim kim bed depositional environment is but i know we had onchopristus spinosaurus leptostyrax i've heard of an lots of crocs. yeah lots of crocs uh, i'm sure it was brackish um but sharks do come into brackish especially mm -hmm. the carcharinids um and carcharina forms but I can guarantee you within a reason, like reasonable doubt. I mean, we have bull sharks that are surviving and have like a living population in Lake Nicaragua. So they can just chill in fresh water and they can reproduce and just exclusively live in fresh water. And they got huge. I mean, we have some of these inch and a quarter bull shark teeth these just dagger triangles dagger triangle uh, <laughs> um that were just meant for tearing into things and the fact that they had you know the giant head big muscular head i'd say they have the most testosterone out of any shark <laughs> going after people going after everything i mean that's 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 how you define a macro predator and an apex predator if they start going after people like it's no one's business Mm -hmm. uh, that's my reasoning and especially the they are no joke they aren't especially the tolerance for bull sharks in fresh water i mean some historic reports i have a couple friends who are working on historical reports of them getting up into the missouri river which is up there in the mississippi river complex so would not be would not want to swim with one of those I'll absolutely say not <laughs> not a good time uh with that though what's your five my five is part of biodon today indeterminate which is mm. this albion species that is yet to be described it's from the tulabuck formation of australia and this was another small tooth genus and this based on the vertebrae size could possibly be one of the largest cretaceous lamniforms that we know of and from what i've heard it's estimated that it can reach lengths of over eight meters and and that's a monster shark and this is in the albion so this is the early cretaceous before it evolves and eventually it'll branch off into your cardabiodon and duardius we don't know if this is the direct ancestor to both of those or maybe an offshoot but it's within the same family Cardabiodon today. And they're interesting. They have um, primitive, some of them have um, two lateral cusplets on each side. And they're, they're very aesthetic teeth. 
you have one of mine that that I want back. <laughs> That's okay. It'll be fine. Um, it's safe in my care. Um, and it really is just crazy looking at that tooth and thinking, man, a jaw full of these and the fact it's a small tooth genus. We'll put that picture up crazy. on here because those some of those Australian teeth, the preservation is phenomenal on them. Absolutely. It's beautiful. Really, really nice. Mm -hmm. And that's a cool, that's a cool uh, shark that I can't wait to, when it's described, to yeah. learn more about it. That'll be a good time. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Patiently but surely, we shall see the reward. Coming in at number four, Chase, what do you got? Uh, we'll just make it quick. We touched it already. Cretoxyrhina mantelli. Um, three, three and a quarter inch, that darn Kansas tooth, obscene. Ah, I just, you, it's crazy. I mean, that's all, I would say it's almost the pinnacle of late Cretaceous sharks. It has some competitors, of course, but yeah. you know, you're sitting here eating pterosaurs like it's no big deal. Yeah. If you but, want, if you want a tooth of a fierce, fierce Cretaceous super predator, go with Cretaxi rhino. That's go the play. with Cretaxi rhino. They're beautiful. They are they incredible are. teeth, especially when they have the cusps. That's really interesting. Yeah. But let's hear your number four now. My number four, you've already said Cretotus crassidens, because, you know, another Cretaceous shark that has teeth that can near three inches. I've read estimates that they say the body size could reach between like nine and 11 meters. This was a no joke shark. I'm, I'm going Crito uh, Crototus crassidens. That's fair. And especially if they were up there messing about with <laughs> Spinosaurus. Oh yeah. That'd pretty, that'd be pretty ideal. Not sure pretty. which, which species was found in um, the chem chem beds, but. Yeah, I'm not sure. That I haven't seen any work. big ones from there. Mm -hmm. Still, that's a paleo artist stream. <laughs> oh yeah, Spinosaurus. And isn't the Kem Kem, <laughs> isn't the Kem Kem known as like one of the most dangerous places of all time? Like, if you went back to the Kem Kem during like when these deposits were layered, like if you went back in the Cretaceous, didn't it have like the largest percentage of predators compared I to? I think so. Else? I think so. God, dinosaur people are going to kill me if this is wrong. I think Carcharodontosaurus is that monster theropod. And then you've got Spinosaurus, which I think we've all agreed upon is this giant dinosaur croc thing with a giant mm -hmm. sail that was just monstrous. Then you've got like monster Elosuchus and a bunch of other crocodiles that just didn't play around. Then you've got giant brackish water sawfish <laughs> um or saw skates or whatever i think they're are they yeah they're sclerinkids right yeah yeah okay saw skates um well they're um sclerinkoids i would say not uh, entirely sure if they're within sclerinkidae i see okay regardless giant <laughs> That rostrum, giant rostral spines, the whole nine yards. Not a fun time to be around at all. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, we're in the top three. Top three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, what do you got for top three? What's your number three? My number three is the good old gray white, Carcharodon carcarius. Had, I had to go with it. It had to. It's a classic. I mean, Jaws is the reason why we all... And by we all, I mean the public has this horrible stigma about sharks, which is totally misfounded. But they did it because they're so cool. Because <laughs> they're this, these giant triangles, you know. I mean, historically in the fossil record, we get three plus inch great whites, which is just obscene. That's a giant shark. Mm. And we know we can probably get a really, really good idea as the body size of those, just considering, you know, they're extant. Um, mm -hmm. just an incredible shark, incredible hunting tactics. Uh, as far as we're aware, one of almost surely one of the reasons why Megalodon went extinct. So it brought down that monster and Hey, I mean, not related to Megalodon besides being in a Lambda form, uh, 
contrary to seemingly popular belief, but they sure helped kill them, <laughs> along with orcas, climate change, and whales deciding to go north. Lots mm-hmm. of fun stuff, but the Great White had to be mentioned. It's a classic. It wouldn't be a top 10 without it. With that, mm-hmm. what's what's your number three? Number three is Peritotis benedidae which is a very large otodontid, so it's related to the megalodon. This is from the Miocene, and it has some of the largest teeth of any Salation species. Their teeth can exceed three inches in length, and if you've seen some of them, they have this massive bulbous root, really thick crown, and they, they have a tearing-type condition with a very bulky hook-shaped tooth in many positions, and it's often referred to as the false mako shark because while I guess superficially people used to think it looked a little bit like a mako, it, it in reality is more so related to the megalodon and comes from that Otodontide lineage. So yeah, that's, that's my top three. That's cool. I, Paratotus benedini is a really interesting shark. It's also cool to notice the similarities and how it evolves along with megalodon it kind of does similar things except s- mm-hmm. with serrating it just decides to get big and very curvy yeah <laughs> i mean it took say. the back seat it definitely took the back seat towards um the megalodon lineage throughout the eocene and the ligocene it was a pretty small shark it was just kind of like you know skating by but then by the miocene it really just bulked up if i recall we have some late pliocene early pleistocene peritotus from the indo-pacific so Mm -hmm. it gets the last laugh it's almost assuredly the last ododontid uh, unless megalolamna's swimming around then but we can't we don't know that yet yeah Um, yeah so peritotus i've seen from the late pliocene slash early pleistocene of indonesia in north central java i've seen them pull out peritotus so this was a pretty long reigning shark too it i mean it outlived megalodon which so this was probably the last otodontid that we had swimming our oceans before becoming extinct it's a really it's really cool to think about that. I mean, the fact that they were fairly close. I, I mean, I don't know when humans evolved. I know. <laughs> and now and now anthropologists are now going to be sad and angry at me. Mason. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So sad. Shout out to Mason. Um, uh-oh. I, I'm fairly confident in saying that probably early humans or just humans in general lived when there were well hominids did yeah yeah at bare minimum my lack of anthropology is just glaring in the in the internet right now oh well that's okay but what top two now we're at number two. Oh man here we go what do you got <laughs> i've got Caracles megalodon at, at number two, two. yeah at two? This- controversy i it's brewing and by brewing i mean boiling yeah i've got the good old carcaracles megalodon it too you know absolute monster biggest shark unless (laughs) i'm very curious as to how you explain that this is number two look man when you only live essentially somewhere in the miocene to the late pliocene you didn't last too long because you specialized too hard and these just got too big too fast and climate change and a whole little plethora of other reasons got them that's just i mean you can't deny the fact that this is the macro predatory shark you know it's the biggest shark of all time i mean unless we are vastly underestimating some of these <laughs> late Cretaceous sharks, <laughs> uh, which we, we aren't. Um, we aren't. It's have to be a filter feeder. Um, some of those carnivite <laughs> that I have filter feeding pavement. Um, but that is not the case. These are the biggest shark of all time and very impressive in size. I mean, you've got a shark that's getting upwards of seven inches, some 
very controversial takes are seven and a quarter, if I recall, that Peruvian tooth that half the audience claims it's just mishmash of multiple teeth. Half the audience mm-hmm. says it's real. Uh, I don't know. Beats yeah. me. But so there have yeah. been there have been some seven inches and above that have been found. I believe they measure them by slant. So it's not going to be the same as if you just did a vertical measurement test, but still, nevertheless, a seven plus inch tooth. Big shark. Big Big shark. shark. Yeah. A lot of the very, very unofficial publications put it, what, like 50 to 70 feet, if I recall. I mean, some of these publications, I mean, admittedly very um they always pandered. change the estimates on them yeah um, i mean a lot of pandering of, to the audience <laughs> most of them that. range between the 50 to 60 foot mark for their mm-hmm. estimates but it's also important to note that they're not measuring they're not testing these based on the largest teeth known mm-hmm. they're doing them on the largest ones they can find within museum collections and I would imagine that the largest megalodon teeth are within private collections and not in museums. Yeah, it's very unfortunate, but yeah, that's kind of the dilemma that you have, especially with such a well-known shark as megalodon. I'm sitting here staring at it. This one's six and a quarter. Um, thank you, North Carolina, <laughs> or thank you, Atlantic Ocean off the coast of North Carolina. But I mean, you've got to think especially with the sharks so notorious so well known a lot of these bigger teeth are going to end up in private collections and that really stinks but you know science good for you collectors out there though it is yeah it (laughs) is it's it's a dream come true for some of these collectors but alas you know massive shark very massive i mean every almost every whalebone you find in the Miocene has a <laughs> bite mark on it. Uh, if they're from Megalodon, we don't know. I mean, you, you can sometimes tell, but alas, it's at number two and I'll turn it over to you. What's your number two? So while the great white was evolving in the Pacific, my pick for number two is its sister species, Carcharodon plicatilis, which is I mean, very similar to the great white. Their teeth weren't serrated, though, so it looks a lot. It's like the broad form for um, Carcharodon histalis. And this is in a late Miocene through early Pliocene species. Their teeth are found over three inches in far more frequency than great white teeth have been. So on average, this was a larger shark which is why I have this at number two and don't have the great white. That's fair. I can get behind that. And yeah, the frequency of them is incredible in the fossil record. I mean, you yeah. find a ton of them as well as, you know, and narrow for, form hastilis. For the record too, we're not saying that finding a three inch Carcharodon plicatilis is easy or common. But within the fossil record as a whole, we are. So there's a big difference between whether you're going out and finding these things and what we know in the fossil record to be found. Big difference. Yeah, a lot of collectors, a lot of collectors shook their head at us disapprovingly. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. it's like those people, those people, how dare they? So we're at number one. And you go Megalodon first. Was not, no, 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 no. No, no, you go first. No, I want to hear it. Okay, we'll just end mine soon. So I got Carcharcles mm-hmm. Megalodon, largest macro predatory shark ever to live, teeth over seven inches in slant height length. And keep in mind, too, that this is, that that's just from what we found. There's going to be a sort of biasing in that when we're collecting these things, we're collecting on like either land sites, river sites, or like um, continental shelves or whatever. Like you, you're you finding them off the um, off of like North Carolina and things like that in the Atlantic. Most of the stuff that we're finding is, is you know, closer towards inland, but we don't have like the pelagic teeth so much because it's still underwater, you know, under a lot 
of water. So there could be potential for larger teeth out there or larger or frequent higher frequencies of larger teeth that we just don't know or we haven't found. So there is some sort of sampling bias, I believe, when it comes to megalodon. So I do think there is potential for a larger tooth. Not for Absolutely. the shark to still be alive, but just for a larger tooth. Just, yeah, <laughs> underline it, italicize yeah. it, bold it, get rid of the italicizing because that doesn't matter, except for the megalodon part. Uh, <laughs> megalodon is extinct. It's gone. Sorry, folks. Sorry to kill the vibe <laughs> for some of you conspiracy theorists out there. It dead. Very dead, as mm -hmm. Southern Me pointed out. All right. And also, I, I want to note, too, for everyone that's watching, that when we're picking, or at least when I'm picking this list, I'm doing one shark per genus. So I'm not having like this entire like top 10 list stacked with like the entire <laughs> evolutionary lineage of Megalodon. So I'm trying to be a little more fair here, but it, like if you were thinking, why isn't Carcharicles Ingocytans or Tupotensis on this list? That's why. People sleeping on Carcharicles Sokolowy. What Damn. do you have at number one? I'm Look, very man, curious about this. Megalodon, Schmegalodon, Squalacorax in four, baby. You already know it's on my arm. We call that a win. My very white arm. I just I don't even know if the exposure got too high for that. Ooh, Lord. Y'all know I burn easily. Squalacorax Pristadonis is at my number one. This shark got very large. Very large. I mean, we have two seven plus inches inch. in length and slant length for teeth large. So, so, yeah, whatever. Um, they were <laughs> look, they had to compete and successfully competed with mosasaurs. And that's not to say that they threw hands with like Mosasaurus Hoffmani or anything, or Hanosaurus was a Bobker. Uh, that's that big Tylosaur that was recently described in Morocco. Um, shout out to Trevor. Uh, <laughs> Look, man, Squalacorax was in a much more hostile environment and it still managed to succeed. The only reason it didn't is because of that giant rock that hit the Yucatan. That's it. That's the only reason why it didn't become a monster. I mean, you can see it as they evolve through the Cretaceous that they're gearing up to be a very, very apex macropredatory animal. I mean, you get that distal notch disappearing you get that tooth i like to say great whiting more or less <laughs> it's it's lining itself up to become a triangle you can see it even in this tooth albeit this is more of kind of pushing more lateral on it but it was going to be a monstrosity and it had so much more adversity to overcome as good old nick saban would say it's our football coach for you um shark not football people um also known as the owner of this great state that's i mean that's why i mean squalacorax pristadon is out lives megalodon in millions of years um and they would have kept going if it weren't for a giant asteroid and the reason why they're such a great predator is because they're just a monster generalist they'll eat anything carrion fish assuredly small mosasaurs while Megalodon, once you got big enough, the only thing you could eat was whales. So, you know, you didn't have and to And other fear. sharks. Yeah, I, sure. I'm sure they ate like a nice Carcardon Hastalis for dinner. Oh, I'm sure. But I'm <laughs> sure a big Carcardon Hastalis probably nibbled on a few juvenile Megalodon here and there. Or at least ate their food. I mean, you specialize too hard and you die. So mm -hmm. is that, you know, what's the definition of apex? If you can eat anything out of your environment or if you can eat one thing and get large off of that one thing, just, just a thought <laughs> process. And I'm sure there's some biologist out there looking at me as though I'm that idiot Southerner <laughs> ranting on about something wrong, but Squalacorax. I, I will say when you talk about them being generalists, it's very true. And that is... I, I find that Squalacorax is basically, they fill a similar ecological niche that car, um, that Carcharhinus does today. Mm -hmm. Like Carcharhinus is a fantastic generalist genus. And that's why they're so prevalent today and why they're the dominant family and 
I would argue the dominant order, uh, Carcharinoforms, that are alive right now, because they're just they're just so good at surviving at doing anything, like filling whatever niche they need to. And that's also why I think um, Squalicorex was so long lived in the Cretaceous. It was very successful. They, they adapted to what they needed to. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. They didn't. They didn't. You know, kind of specify into a certain feeding. Like they didn't. You'd always have your offshoots. You'd have your bizarre mm -hmm. sharks that did that. So, like in Squalicorex, yeah. you'd have Tychocorax, and then there are some oddball Carcharinids as well. But yeah, for I the mean, most part, we're talking. Even in Carcharina forms, I mean, you got the bonnet head that does this relatively the same thing uh, Tychocorax does. I mean, you've got nice cutting dentition in front, though I think it's more probably more grasping in Sphere and Tibro bonnet head, but Regardless, since they focus more on these uh, decapods and other, you know, animals of that sort, they have a crushing dentition in their laterals. There's just so many, essentially, connections between um, carcharinids, carcharinoforms, and squalocorax and the anacoracids. So it's just something that you can't deny that almost inevitably, if they hadn't been rocked by that lovely asteroid they'd be thriving and they were thriving in the late cretaceous they were i would say the biggest shark in the maestrichtian by a fair amount at that so well we still had some scopanorhynchus in the maestrichtian but they yeah, were on the way out yeah i suppose they're, but they're incredibly rare yeah, I mean, in so in Morocco, you can find Scopanorhynchus rapax, I believe. That's true, but, you can. But I will say, Squalicorex prisidanus can exceed two inches in length in um, Morocco. Mm -hmm. So that that is a big, big fish. Which and one would you rather take? Gonna... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was I was going to say. I forgot what I was going to say. Ah, you dang go. it. <laughs> you go. Okay. I was going to say, which one would you rather choose? A darn two-inch serrated monster or a two-inch little stabby boy? Which one would you rather choose? The answer is I will simple. say you get more shark for shark with a serrated boy. Yeah, you get a lot more heft. You get a lot more bite. Especially, oh, yeah, oh what man, I'm... What I say is when you look at those massive Squalicorex Prisidonis, like when they get like above an inch and a half or so, they they're just triangles they're like heart-shaped triangles they're i mean they're incredible and i mean i think people a lot of people when they discuss the diet of uh, squalicorax cristodonis really don't give credence to the bite strength and the tooth strength i mean that is a thick thick tooth i mean it is very akin to the great white um and i think that shows just in general you know, they're a lot stronger. You don't get much wear on Squalicorax teeth uh, in the late Cretaceous. I know some of you are like, well, half the ones I find. Yes, but you, on average, you get less feeding wear on Squalicorax than other, other sharks. So take that all into consideration when you understand that Squalicorax was almost assuredly now half of what i did was a meme because i love squalicorax it's my favorite shark but they were honestly one of the most prolific sharks especially in the late cretaceous so i've said See, my you, piece on you, squalicorax <laughs> you pulled off your explanation surprisingly well do yeah, i no. agree with you no but <laughs> but mm -hmm. you pull it off well <laughs> you defended your point <laughs> crow shark go nom nom that's all i have to say and every researcher i've talked to just just, just <laughs> oh lord <laughs> gotta add well, fun to science <laughs> I'm telling you yeah so i'll i'll give a few honorable mentions because as Ooh, yeah I said that's before, fair i didn't pick everything so honorable mentions for me otodus obliquus everything going from otodus obliquus to megalodon fits on there the Great White is an honorable mention. Uh, Cardabiot on Venator, as you said, honorable mention. 
Uh, let's see, some honorable mentions for me. I think the very early Paleocene um, Ododontids, like Atodus nidini, just considering <laughs> how different they were compared to every other little sand tiger like um, Paleocene shark, um, especially yeah. considering uh, one of the teeth we pulled out of Mississippi uh, for a study. It was about 300,000 years after the KPG. It was an inch and a half long blade. Do with that what you will. Yeah. That's a big shark. Just a stone's throw away. There was nothing at that time. Like right mm -hmm. after the yeah. KPG, there really wasn't anything swimming those oceans that would have mm -hmm. been approaching that. Yeah, and it's mainly because our oceans couldn't really support it. So it's a miracle that they actually managed to do that. Uh, another, let's see, Tychotis. God, Tychotis, and it's very, very, ah, you know, I mean, apex. I don't know yeah, if that it would was be a macro predator, though. I mean, it is because it's a monster and it ate monster yeah. decapods. Well, not really decapods, it ate monster cephalopods and monster bivalves i mean you get these like I guess, six yeah. foot inocerimid clams so i mean you could that's that's a macro predator just to the not now macro what we're yeah thing. not what we were focusing on but no. yeah <laughs> but still a fist-sized tychotis isn't going to get messed around with regardless but you know mm -hmm. i guess in, in a weird technicality it's one of these it, it falls into the honorable mentions what are yeah. a few others i mean there are some like you know not a lasma branks that we could go into and some very we'll primitive we'll do that one branks. in another episode because uh, there's some fun ones that there we'll are mention. there are some that'll make make you all go what is that why does that exist how does that exist why it's mm -hmm. they're a vibe they're a really good vibe and what are some others i'm trying to think of some other honorable mentions Tiger shark, duh, inch and a, you know, inch and a half size tooth, uh, ate anything it so very well pleased. It's another yep. good one. Mm -hmm. The whale shark. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say Pricerus macrorhiza. Oh, that's Some of true. those teeth got monstrous. That's another one of those Cretaceous lomniforms. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. Um, if anyone I... thinks that we missed anything, let us know in the comments. Mm -hmm. Please do. I'm struggling. And if you agree or disagree with Squalicorex being the top apex predator of all time, as far as sharks go, let us know. Let us know if you disagree. Shout out to my crow shark <laughs> boys. Y'all know who you are. Crow <laughs> shark for the win. Crow shark in five. Well, that's about all that we got for you guys tonight. So I hope you enjoyed the first episode of Elasmo uh, Elasmo Cast. <laughs> got to remember our name. Yeah. And don't forget to <laughs> like and subscribe. Hit that bell notification so we're growing this this up and coming paleontology podcast channel. Heck yeah! Get out of the way. We'll catch you guys next time. Yeah, catch y'all on the Elasmo side. <laughs> <laughs> oh.